They have run into problems, however, with the MPAA before its release in the USA due to issues with its gore and sexual nature. It had to be trimmed back to get an R rating. Over the years, when you see releases advertised uncut, what you're actually seeing is the cut that was released outside the USA. More serious problems arose due to copyright infringement with its story. When the film came out, it was brought to the attention of 2000 AD's publishers that the movie had borrowed the plot from a short seven-page story called Shock that was published in a Judge Dredd annual in 1981, written and drawn by Kevin O'Neill. The story involved a guy purchasing robot parts for his girlfriend, who in turn uses it to make an art piece, but then it kicks back into operation and tries to kill her. If you are familiar with hardware, you can see the obvious comparisons, but to director Richard Stanley's defence, he had been inspired by other materials such as Solvent Green, Damnation Alley, The Long Tomorrow and the works of Philip K. Dick. Richard was unaware of the legal issues surrounding the comparisons between the script and the old Future Shock story after the release of the movie, as it was handled by the producers behind the scenes. The later had to admit he had borrowed ideas from it, but in large, most of the script is based on his old short movie, Incidents in an Expanding Universe. Richard's cousin had worked for IPC during the time when they were published in 2000 AD, and the comics surrounded Richard in his youth so the designs and stories had in some part influenced him with the writing process of hardware. Fleetway Comics brought a successful lawsuit <laughs> so a notice was added to the DVD and Blu-ray releases giving credits to the script's publisher. There were also other legal problems on who owned the movie. Once the VHS and Laserdisc had been released, Palace Pictures went bust and the library of movies were sold off to Polygram. Then the rights moved to Universal Pictures and then to MGM. Also, Miramax played a part in this, so you have many parties involved further delaying any release of the movie on current video formats. Thankfully, come 2009, these issues were eventually resolved. During the 80s, the director of hardware, Richard Stanley, had been working in the music industry directing music videos, the films of Nephilim, Public Image Limited, and Renegade Soundwave and had always wanted to move into feature films. He had a desire to produce more than just music videos and short movies. The production company he was hired by to direct the music videos was Wicked Films and TV Limited, who was made up of other filmmakers who wanted to push forward with their careers and move into feature film production. Getting into the industry was a challenge for many creative people. Because you had to be part of a union and jumping through those hoops to be part of one wasn't easy. So many young filmmakers went into music videos, as that wasn't under strict union rules of membership. Everyone at Wicked Film and TV wanted to make a movie, and the easiest way to get the finances was to produce a genre picture, either it be sci-fi or horror. Richard had already developed a feature-length script called Hardware, based off a short Super 8 movie he made in 1985, called Incidents in an Expanding Universe. His script was sold a few years back, and made its way to the producers at Wicked Film and TV, and they loved it. And with it being a genre piece, he got an interest from Palace Pictures, who at the time had made a name for themselves distributing Evil Dead and Diva. They finally got hold of Richard, who was out in Afghanistan to document the Soviet war, and managed to get him to return to England and shoot the film. To help with financing, Palace Pictures got Miramax involved to handle distribution in the USA. Hardware became the first picture Miramax and Palace Pictures co-financed. With Miramax involved came a number of... Shut up, Molly! For fuck's sake! They wanted the movie to have some American actors involved so it could be marketed to US audiences and the violence to be toned down as the original script had far more death scenes than what we eventually saw in the final cut. Originally, the film was set in England in a futuristic council estate. With Miramax wanting American leads, it changed the setting to New York. Which had Fuck. confused people by having the security guards be Caribbean, the people downstairs were Chinese, and the character Shades is Northern Irish which is what sci-fi films set in the future tend to do with having a mix of cultures. The production started in September of 1989, shot entirely in London, making use of the roundhouse at Spillers Wharf in East London, and the opening scene was shot in Morocco with a skeleton crew and it was the last piece to be shot in the production. The roundhouse was a complete shell at the time and had been lying derelict for years. With it being located directly next to a railway line, it made it difficult to record sound, otherwise it was ideal. They constructed Jill's apartment in the middle of the roundhouse, and with it being a non-union production, they could film for 24 hours a day. So during the day, the actors would do their scenes, and the majority of the sequences featuring the robot would be handled in the evening and early hours. Other locations in and around London helped expand the dystopian future. For the scenes with Mo and Shades walking through rubble and metallic junk, the crew didn't really have to do much set dressing. There were many parts of London that hadn't been redeveloped and had been left in a mess for years, so it made it really easy for the filmmakers to capture a derelict wasteland. 
for the props and costumes in order to save money they went to military auctions and purchased old equipment and clothes that could be modified or taken apart to create new sets and outfits for the actors you may notice at the end of the movie it says dedicated to richard bedford who was actually the original editor of the movie but sadly passed away while they were shooting the main cast of hardware is pretty small in numbers it does have some interesting cameos Dylan McDermott plays Moses Baxter, known to his friends as Mo. He is an ex-soldier with very religious views, and an artificial hand that gives him extra strength. The part was originally intended for Bill Paxton. Paxton was enthusiastic about the script, but Miramax and Palace Pictures apparently didn't know much about Bill, and his agent wasn't contacted, and by the time someone got around to speaking with him, it signed on to Navy Seals. Dylan was going through a bad patch at the time of shooting. He was dating Julia Roberts, and halfway into the shoot, they separated. So he became very depressed, and Richard Stanley felt the tone of his performance had changed. Stacey Travis plays Jill, Mo's girlfriend, who works as a sculptor and is living on benefits. She spends her spare time smoking the government-controlled cannabis cigarettes and watching the disturbing imagery that now dominates TV. In this future, torture, images of death, footage of dictators dominates the networks. John Lynch plays Shades, who is a heavy drug user and takes a made-up drug called Moonflash. He apparently takes LSD, but they couldn't say that on film, so they changed the name. His character's backstory is not revealed, but the director stated on the commentary to the movie that Shades wears glasses to shield his eyes from the sun, as he spends most of his time in space repairing satellites, and has returned to Earth but is struggling to adjust. The part of Shades was originally intended for Jeffrey Combs. The late Mark Northover plays Alvy, who runs a junk and repair shop. If you are a fan of the film Willow, you will recognise Mark as he played Burglecut, one of the best characters in that movie. It's hard to tell if Mark has been dubbed or not. It doesn't sound like his voice. It could be an ADR issue, but it's always left me a bit unsure if that's his real voice. The late William Hootkins plays Lincoln, the voyeuristic pervert who lives opposite Jill and spies on her. William is a superb actor and has popped up in many movies playing small parts. He was in Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Superman 4, and before filming Hardware, he was in Batman playing Lieutenant Eckhart. William would ad-lib a lot of his disgusting, perverse lines and freaked out the women on set. For the movie's cameos, we have Iggy Pop providing his voice as Angry Bob, the radio disc jockey who delivers the depressing news of the day. Richard Stanley originally wanted John Lydon, but I believe he was unavailable, but the producer Nick Powell of Palace Pictures, who had connections with Virgin Records, helped him get some... <laughs> Cole McCoy plays the Nomad who opened and ends the movie. The Nomad unearths the Mark 13 robot. Carl at the time was the lead singer of the goth rock band Films of Nephilim, for whom Richard Stanley had previously directed two music videos and designed an album cover. McCoy's character in Hardware is basically the same as it was in Nephilim's work. And finally we have the late great Lemmy from Motorhead playing the water taxi driver. Richard Stanley didn't get many of the people he wanted for the movie. Sinead O'Connor was intended for this role as he wanted a woman who looked a bit like Tank Girl. But she pulled out at the last minute. But thankfully Lenny came to the rescue and took the part, apparently, for a bottle of Jack Daniels. The movie opens in an irradiated wasteland. A scavenger is seen trekking across the dunes and stumbles across a buried robot. He takes the robot and remaining parts to a junk dealer called Alvy in the city. Mo and his friend Shades bump into the scavenger before he can speak with Alvy and make a deal with him. Mo offers Alvy the remaining parts but keeps the head to give to his girlfriend Jill as a gift for Christmas. As Mo and Jill spend some time together, they are unaware of voyeuristic neighbour Lincoln is watching them by a telescope. Mo and Jill argue about the new government sterilisation plan and the morality of having children. In this dystopian world, there are strict rules and the population control is now becoming more apparent. Later that evening, Jill works the robot head into a sculpture. Mo is unsure what it's supposed to represent and suggests maybe creating something she can sell as money is becoming very tight. Mo receives a phone call from Alvy who urges him to return to his shop. Alvy has been investigating the remaining parts when he sold him, and has discovered they belong to a new robot called the Mark 13, which is a deadly new military machine. Mo reluctantly goes, but the name Mark 13 rings a bell, he grabs his Bible and finds the phrase, no flesh shall be spared. Could this new robot be the government's plan to control the population? Mo finds Alvy dead and discovers evidence that the robot is an experimental combat model capable of self-repair. Alvy's notes also indicate a defect, a weakness to humility. Back at the apartment, the robot has fully awoken and reassembles itself using pieces of Jill's metal sculptures and recharges the power source by draining her apartment's power supply. Mo panics and calls Jill's apartment. The robot answers the phone. Mo gets a quick glimpse of the Mark 13 before it hangs up. 
He quickly contacts Shades and asks him to check on Jill, but Shades is in the middle of a drug trip and barely coherent. Mo runs back to Jill's before it's too late. Jill awakens and doesn't realise the robot is behind her. She narrowly avoids getting slashed. The apartment is now in lockdown and there is no way for her to escape. In order to keep within budget, they avoid using complicated optical effects, and they achieve 90% of the visual and special effects within camera. As the story focuses on the deadly robot, image animation they were recently launched on Hellraiser created all the sets of points that could be upgraded for each shot. You couldn't have one master shot or robot as it would be incredibly difficult to budget. What? But there does appear to be one master shot. Oh, he's painting his mud. Oh, he's having a wank. Hello. How have you been? You been alright? What are you doing for that? Skillet. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you. Is it engaged, isn't it? It is, alright. Is that a large by any chance? I'm not sure. 42, I think. 32. Hmm. It tastes nice. When are you going over? Probably about half hours. Half hours. You're going to be there for 10 minutes. Oh, fuck's sake. I know. Fucking let down in here. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, 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 wait, wait.
I thought it sold out, but if you go to Simon's website, you can still purchase the CD and LP. Definitely worth hunting down before they finally go out of stock. Hardware was not a film I was familiar with growing up, and only in later years it came to my attention. I heard from friends about its unofficial connection to 2000 AD comics, and they didn't look upon it favourably, but I was intrigued to see it. Due to its legal problems, I attempted to hunt it down, but there was no DVD at the time. I certainly wasn't going to locate an old VHS copy, as I abandoned that film years ago. So I thought, well, let's find the Laserdisc, but had zero luck finding it, as it wasn't a common title. As I started producing videos for YouTube, the question would always pop up for a review on hardware. Thankfully, at that point, the DVD and Blu-ray had got its release. So I picked it up and watched it for the first time, only just a year or two ago. And to be honest, I found it an underwhelming experience. Firstly, it's a great looking movie, there's no doubt there. It's photography, production design, in-camera practical robot effects, and Richard Stanley's visual eye, who created something quite unique. And when you consider it's very low budget, we made a small independent movie that looked something Hollywood was putting out at the time with ten times the amount of money spent. But the main problem I had with it was the story was kind of wafer thin. It gets most of its plot out of the way about 30 minutes into the movie, then descends into chaos, which could be seen as a positive for some. But for me, it felt like a short story stretched out to 90 minutes. Criticisms of its plot is something Richard Stanley is aware of, as he says the rest of the movie becomes a nightmare once the plot is laid out in the first quarter. There is a lot of padding in the film as the plot struggles to fill out the remaining runtime. Jill watching the TV, the love making scene part of an extended sci-fi music video thanks to all the added video graphics, and the pervert Lincoln just adds a layer of unwanted nastiness to the film. Lincoln does get what he deserves if he comes to a gruesome death. Now going with the idea of a whole story focusing on the apartment, it begins to run out of steam. We know they are trying to keep the budget down and having one location make sense, thank the god. But I was just wanting to see more of what was outside the window. As an audience member, it's very much like being stuck in a room and you can't get out. And when you do manage to escape, it's not so long. When the robot attacks the second time, you get that feeling that the film has run its course. If the robot exited her flat and attacked the other people, then it would step up the action to offer something a little different. But we just have Jill suit up and take on the robot with more aggression after the death of Mo, and finally defeats it with a little help from Shades. With the film dealing with drug use with two other characters, you notice that Mo is the only one that is clean and sober, but he unfortunately gets killed off. Richard Stanley believes people often perform better while intoxicated <coughs> and during the crisis, so Jill, who was stoned throughout, and Shades, who was tripping off LSD, survive their encounter with the robot. I don't think everyone performs well in a crisis while high in real life, but maybe Richard Stanley's better at dealing with problems while completely smashed. With it being a genre 